Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here for um, our conversation um, today, Keep Calm and Conserve the Planet. And um, I've got a couple of um, great guests um, joining me to talk with us today. Um, so Mibu Fisher here is a Kwandamuka woman from North Stradbroke Island. Um, with connections to Nu, Naku, Nui and Gurunpu clans of the Moreton Bay area. So, um, you know, I keep thinking about our beautiful, um, you know, river here, the Mewa, um, moving out into um, your country and also Megan Coates' work um, beginning the show, um, really special having this um, strong um, Kwandamuka contribution here, Mibu. And, um, and uh, Mibu um, is a marine ecologist at the CSIRO and um, doing a lot of interesting work there, so we'll hear more about that. Um, and then Phil on my left is a Narrabul and Wirriyarrai um, Murray um, coming from New England in northern New South Wales. So um, some saltwater countries, um, Phil, uh, stories um, Phil's going to uh, share with us. Uh, and he's, um, he's young, but he's the national campaign uh, and organising manager at SEED, Indigenous Youth Climate Network, um, and um, has been really working hard um, uh, engaging his community and a lot of young people uh, looking at both Indigenous rights and climate rights. So a uh, couple of very special um, guests with me here today. And um, maybe I might kick off, um, Phil, just getting you to... Um, I'll pass over the mic, but just to tell us a little bit more about um, maybe um, kind of in introducing yourself, be really nice to just get a sense of that country that you come from and the waters there. Yeah, I'm going in here. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Philip Murray. I'm a Ngarrabul and Wiriwai Murray from Tamworth in northern New South Wales in the New England area. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the country that we're gathering on here today um, and acknowledge that we are on Yagara and Turrbal country. Pay my respects to um, those people and to their ancestors and their elders, both past and present, and acknowledge that their sovereignty has never been ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I was born and grew up in Tamworth in northern New South Wales on Gamilaroi country, our country, and um, growing up we spent a lot of time on the rivers, freshwater rivers in northern New South Wales. So uh, the Peel River in and around Tamworth, the, the Man River between Glen Innes and Grafton, the Arara River, um, the Clarence River. We spent a lot of time on these rivers and I became a really core part of who I am and of um, and my identity as an Aboriginal person. We spent a lot of time um, fishing and swimming and just mucking around in these rivers and jumping out, you know, swinging off tree branches and jumping into the creeks and whatnot across um, that part of the world. And um, as I got older, I started to realise there was something that was really wrong with with our country and like what was saying was really wrong with what was happening. Um, you know, to water on our country. And um, a few years back, I'd say probably uh, around 2013, um, we, I guess I had a bit of a, a light bulb mo moment. Um, I had noticed, you know, that the decline in, the, um, in waterways and the impacts of climate change were starting to experience. And down in our country, we were fighting against... Um, coal and coal seam gas, so Whitehaven Coal wanted to build this enormous coal mine in the Laird State Forest and Santos did and still do want to make a 780 well gas field um, in the Pilliga State Forest down there and um, that's when I really became involved in the environmental fight and like fighting to protect country at that point in time and um, I hadn't really started to tie that into the issue of climate change. At that point in time, it was just about protecting our water, protecting our sacred sites, um, and ensuring the survival of our culture. And around about 2016, so that was about four or five, four years ago, um, we were camped out on, we have this beautiful river that flows through our Ngarrabul country, the Severn River, uh, Gawaban Nanda, we call it in our language. And this river, um, is the home of the Murray Cod Dreaming, Guru Dreaming, and we have this huge gorge on this indigenous protected area that our people um, manage. There's this massive gorge, and the, we were camping out on the river in actually 2014. What am I saying? 2014. And um, my great uncle, Uncle Keith Byrne, 
he was um, 84 years old at the time and he passed away last year. But he grew up on that river and he'd spent his whole life in and around that country. And he said to me, you know, he's very, this really somber kind of tone that he had never seen the river this low in his life and he was worried that the river was going to die. And um, I have a five-year-old daughter and um, I guess thinking about the way that I grew up connected to the rivers and the waterways and that across the country, that really, um, I don't know, made me feel really heartbroken. Um, and so I had to see the links between um, the things that were happening not just directly affecting country in terms of like the coal and gas companies taking the water from our country but the impacts was then happening when that coal and gas was burnt and the climate change that was occurring that was causing the river levels 350 kilometers away on another part of our country to be declining and um yeah i um that's when i started to get interested in climate action as a thing and got involved with seed indigenous youth climate network and um, lucky enough to work full time there and work on campaigns to protect country from the impacts of climate change. Um, just last year, my, my daughter said to me one night, because uh, I was explaining to her, we had this big fish kill on um, one another river that flows through our country, Gitta Gully, the McIntyre River. And it's a, really, a river that's really central to dreaming stories of our people, the black swan dreaming story, especially. In, um, and so in, the, in this story, it's a love story uh, between a couple and um, Birujangi and Gurai. And um, so every night I used to have my daughter was like, can you tell me the story of Birujangi and Gurai? And so we'd always tell this story and talk about the river and we'd been there and you know, looked at the river and shown this river. And so I told her, I said, oh, you know, like tens of thousands of fish have come up dead in the river and this is really sad. And she said, um, she just looked at me and she said, oh, what will happen if the river dies? She said, well, the story of Birujangi and Gurai die then too. And that for me was like, I don't know, those kind of things really pull on me really hard. And I guess the kind of thing that makes me fired up and uh, motivated to take action and fight to protect country. And so, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I do my day to day. I work on campaigns to stop fracking and mining and protect country from climate change and protect water. Yeah, there's so much more to hear about that, but um, maybe also, Mibu, to throw um, to you and um, tell us a little bit about the, um, your country. And also, I'm so sorry because I mentioned salt water, but fresh water, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm a salt water woman from Kondamuka out here in Moton Bay, and um, I spent a lot of my childhood out there um, on the beach with my family, and I just had that strong connection um, drawing me towards the ocean and, and the salt water. And so um, when I finished high school, I decided to go a different route and um, went straight to marine science and have been working in the marine science field since 2009 for CSIRO. And it's more recently, I would say, maybe the past five years that I have really become more passionate about including traditional knowledge um, with marine science in particular, um, because I've seen how it's been incorporated into the terrestrial um, areas and um, I've heard lots of different stories from around the coast of Australia but also internationally about what other traditional people are doing around the world and um, that really has got me interested in learning more about climate change and the effects that that can have on culture, um, not just to traditional stories, but also to traditional livelihoods and um, how people are actually going to be affected by, by living, basically. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing at work at the moment. Um, yeah, listening to lots of stories about um, our brothers and sisters in Greenland and in the Pacific as well as down in Tasmania, um, and so, yeah, that's... And maybe we were just, when we were talking before, you mentioned about, um, I was interested that you've, you've kind of um, been making this transition, in a sense, from uh, your work as a scientist to almost looking at um, your organisation, the CSIRO, and how it looks to change and um, incorporate uh, Indigenous knowledge and find new ways of kind of re-engineering itself. Um. Yeah, so um, our CEO um, had an uh, aha moment a few years ago at Gama Festival in the Northern Territory and um, I think it really helps to have someone at that senior level who is supportive of 
Indigenous culture to start to be embedded within CSIRO and um, for them to also recognise that Indigenous science and what the contributions that's had to the Australian continent for thousands of years and how that we can only make our science contribution as a nation stronger by including the two different knowledge systems together. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really have been looking at that organisational change in including that. Yeah. And you were mentioning you've got a good um, uh, team of people you work with who take energy from that, that group. Yeah, I'm really lucky. I have a team of... There's probably about 10 people in the team, but five of us are young Indigenous women with a marine science background, which is quite unique. Um, and we all work around Australia. We're based in Cairns, Brisbane, WA, um, and we support each other because we have that passion and we're just finding more and more young Indigenous, in particular women, every day that are graduating from university in marine science who we just can, you know, add to our energy and... and trying to really make a change in, in what we're doing in our science. And how do you um, think about that change? Because there's, there's so many, it feels like there are so many areas and like I know, um, Phil, you're working in relation to fracking. Um, uh, you know, I think there's so much to be learnt from traditional knowledge, but then that, in sometimes I think that's kind of, also a kind of philosophy that then um, enables a whole lot of new learning and new systems that perhaps we haven't invented or we're, st we're still um, reacting and inventing. Like, there's so much to be done. How do, where do you focus your energies? Um, for me, I find... Uh, like, I'd like to distill my philosophy about um, how to solve the climate crisis into a couple of sentences. One is... Um, Aboriginal control of Aboriginal affairs and the other one is Aboriginal land and Aboriginal hands. And um, I've always seen the, the fight for Aboriginal uh, sovereignty and the fight for Aboriginal land rights as integral to uh, solving the climate crisis and the, 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 um, that when Aboriginal people are put in control and when Aboriginal people are able to make the decisions and to decide what is and isn't allowed to happen on, on country. Like we see around the world that Indigenous people um, preserve over 80% of the world's biodiversity, you know, despite being less than 20% of the world's population. Um, and, like, we know that that is, you know, to me that's the most straightforward, obvious thing to be fighting for all the time. Um, and I, I chose to exert my energy on uh, stopping the fossil fuel companies um, and to stop particularly the opening of new fossil fuel basins in, um, you know, places like the, Gal uh, the, the Galilee Basin, the Adani's coal mine and uh, the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory where, you know, companies want to open up the largest untapped fossil fuel reserve in the world, which would, which suppose has enough gas theoretically to supply the world and keep the world hooked on gas for another 400 years. Um, you know, so we can't afford 400 more years of, um, of carbon emissions at the kind of rates that we would be having if we were, you know, continuing to utilise those things. And, um, and so I've, I've um, yeah, I, don't, I guess I have a very analytical mind and so having a look at the, where, what the biggest causes of uh, climate change were and the emissions that we are producing around the world and it's primarily coming from energy, it's coming from coal and gas and oil that we're using around the world which then distills into so many different systems and um, I decided that, yeah, I would wanted to focus my energy on combining those two things, the fight for Aboriginal land rights and Aboriginal sovereignty um, with the fight to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And I see those two things as being one and the same and that's yeah, why I work on that. Yeah, so I, I guess I have chosen to focus my energy in trying to empower as many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia, but also internationally, um, other Indigenous peoples. Because I think, um, echoing what Phil was saying around like, I think self-determination and self-governance is the, the biggest empowerment tool for Indigenous communities. And without that, um, th yeah, without that, there's not much else you can do, but you'll be you're constantly up against a wall. And so if I can do what I can from terms of like my science perspective in trying to push changes in these big science organisations, but also pushing back against our funders um, in making sure that we actually are um, creating science projects that are led with 
or led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia because it is so important to have um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the forefront of our sciences to make better science for Australia. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit, you were mentioning about, uh, we were talking about Tasmania and I was fascinated with um, also that um, Lola Greeno, um, uh, who made the beautiful um, water carriers out of kelp, um, which are in the exhibition that you've been um, working a bit with her son and we were talking about that um, interrelation of uh, science and, um, and art, um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if everyone's seen, but in here um, there is an exhibition by Lola and she also has some of her shell necklace, I think, is in there. Um, and so her son Dean and I um, have been working around writing a paper on Indigenous perspectives on climate change with other um, international colleagues. And um, because Dean is a fine arts student at the University of Tasmania, we we're trying to work out how we can integrate his arts perspective, his fine arts perspectives into our science paper. And um, I think it, it's definitely a struggle for me coming from my science brain and my science background, but having my, um, my cultural heritage like there strong knowing that um, the creative side of things is a, as a way of storytelling is also um, interesting. And I think that if we incorporate science with art more, we'll be able to reach more people with our science information because I think that's a big block at the moment in science is we're not communicating our science properly. And so if we can, um, you know, put our science into more alternative yeah. aspects rather than a paper, then um, the better, yeah. So uh, maybe more room for science in galleries and uh, I hope so. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, just going off that, um, the mariner shells that you'll see in there, um, the Tasmanian Aboriginal community are uh, concerned around um, the climate change impacts of those shells because Tasmania is a hot spot um, for global warming, and they're starting to see a decline in the amount of shells that they are actually getting, and so you know that. that they don't have the answers for that, but that's where we can combine the traditional knowledge of where they collect those things with the Western science to try and work out how they can continue to keep their culture in what they're facing with climate change um, because it's so important to them and it's part of who they are as a person. So I think that's really important as well. So they've also had a um, huge disturbance with the mutton bird um, arrivals, haven't they? Uh, they haven't really come down this year, yeah. Do you know? <laughs> and, um, and are there other stories? Um, I mean, Phil, it was really nice hearing at the beginning about, um, you know, your country and growing up and uh, uh, I suppose what's happening more recently with um, the fish kills. Um, I mean, you've, you've also been involved with the, the fr campaign against fr fracking in the Northern Territory. Um, I'm meandering a bit, but I'm just thinking it's really interesting both of you... Um, connecting to your own communities, but that your national networks are really interesting. I mean, national and international, um, you know, how it's it's lovely how strongly you're working with other young Indigenous people across your work. Um, is, could you talk a little bit about um, just what you're learning and enjoying in that process? Um, I think the thing I enjoy the most, like we, so February of last year, after the there was a huge fish kill in the um like the Barker, the Darling River, out at um um how past Brewarrida Bre and um you know over a million fish washed up dead on the shores of that um of that river after a heat wave that um, caused yeah drastic changes in the um in the environment for the the fish and um, we organised an action last in February of last year in. Parliament House in Canberra. We brought together um, over 120 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from literally every corner of the continent, um, you know, from the Torres Strait, from the Kimberley, from Tasmania, um, and then every other, every other state and territory. We came together down at the Aboriginal Tent Embassy and we planned an occupation of um, Parliament House. And so we did that. We brought together all these people who had never really experienced any kind of um, like activism or big protests before and like, um, you know, kind of a little bit 
iffy about doing it and just be like, oh, you know, is this like, is this a safe thing for me for us to do? Is there, you know, is this all right for us to do? And um, they came into par Parliament House and they um, they left. Uh, the, everything went extremely well. We shut down Parliament House and um, you know they got an absolute bucket load of media attention and. Um, you know, they were able to tell their stories about the things that were happening in different parts of the country. Uh, people from the Torres Strait able to talk about the rising, uh, the rising sea levels and the, um, how this was washing over people's graves. Um, you know, you have people from Tasmania like uh, Jam who were talking before able to talk about those impacts that were happening on the shells and the kelp and the mountain birds down in Tasmania. Um, yeah, people from the uh, like across the Murray Darling Basin talking about the impacts on their water. People from places like Walgett talking about how the water completely, you know, there's undrinkable water in the town and like the Namoi River has um, had run dry and just flowed today for uh, this last week for the first time in two years. And those people all left with this great sense of empowerment, like, oh, you know, we've, we can do this amazing thing. And this is the thing that I really enjoy about this kind of work is that you can make people feel like uh, they do have some form of a voice and they do have the power to make, um, you know, to get that voice out there. And so, um, some of the people who came there came from the community of Minieri in the Northern Territory. Um, and Minieri is one of the areas that is covered by extent, um, extensive gas, shale gas fracking licenses. Um, Alawa country and huge parts of Alawa country covered by licenses for companies like Origin Energy and Santos to, uh, to frack for gas up there. And communities there are really worried about that and it's been a big deal in the NT for a long time. There was a, um, an inquiry a few years ago that um, you know, made a, a bunch of recommendations and said, okay, yes, fracking, go ahead if you meet these 147 different uh, conditions. And um, one of those conditions was the establishing of no-go zones um, in places in and around communities where fracking companies were not allowed to happen, uh, were not allowed to go and fracking was not allowed to happen. And Minero was not included in those, like, areas of no-go zones. And so, and no Aboriginal, like, remote Aboriginal communities were um, the government basically saw it as a, we'll fob this off to the Northern Lands Council and they can deal with all of these permit issues and everything else. Um, and so the community of Minieri, for the first time ever, the people who had come to Canberra, taken part in that Water is Life gathering, they got together, they held a survey of people in the community. 99.99.5% um, of the people in, in the community um, agreed that they didn't want, that they wanted the community declared a no-go zone for fracking. They painted up a big sign and everything just, you know, saying that and they held a march through the streets of Minieri. Like people talk about the school strike, but the school helped like every child in Minieri to join in on this big uh, march through the streets of Minieri and they erected this sign, you know, outside the thing and um, outside the town. And um, for me to see seeing that and seeing them go from, oh, we're not sure about doing like, you know, activisty kind of things ourselves to like, organising themselves to, yeah, to do a survey like that, declare themselves a no-go zone for fracking when the government refused to do that for them. And then, you know, um, yeah, getting young kids involved in that sort of action and seeing that as a thing they can do, that makes me feel, uh, that makes me feel great. That makes me feel like, um, yeah, doing that work with communities all over the country is worthwhile and empowering. Is there much, um, what's the place uh, for art in that? Like I just, as you were speaking about that um, activist history and I'm thinking about the incredible, um, you know, uh, petitions and statements um, to parliament um, that have uh, incorporated um, artworks and come out of communities. But, um, you know, I imagine there's a whole lot of different ways um, maybe, you know, through um, ceremony and performative ways um, to... Uh um, so some of the... Um, taking art, like, not just in terms of the visual sense, but also music and whatnot. So, um, like, in addition, like, the obvious, I guess... Um, I'm not an artist or an arty person, so I don't know all the right words for this kind of thing, but all the visual art stuff, um, you know, paintings and um, those sorts of things that come out of communities that are then used to tell those stories and to convey those messages. Um, some of the key leaders of the fight against fracking in the Northern Territory are um, Aboriginal musicians. Um, and so, uh, for example, um, Uncle Ray Dixon and um, Eleanor Dixon, they form a duet called um, Rayella and they've been... Uh, really active campaigning against fracking across the Northern Territory. Uncle Ray is an absolute thorn in the side of, uh, you know, of Origin Energy and of the government across this time. Um, Gadrian Hooson and others from the community of Borroloola, um, part of like the Sandridge Band, and um, they, yeah, using 
um, the platform that they have through music to uh, talk about the things that are happening on their country. Community of Boralula was the first one before Minieri to declare themselves um, you know, a frack-free community, first um, distinct Aboriginal community in Australia to do that. Um, yeah, it's a bunch of other musicians that have uh, been involved in that fight and um, um, yeah, people like um, Emily Watermurrow and um, Dan Sultan and so on who are you know, Aboriginal people from the Northern Territory, sort of well-known musicians nationally that, are, that use their platform to share that message and uh, be part of that fight to protect country up there. And, um, I might just um, open up to our audience and see if any of you have uh, questions that you'd like to um, put to um, Phil and Mibu or to hear more about um, uh, the work that they're doing or, yeah. Well, I've got a little bit of a, um, a question, um, you know, maybe about um, your uh, a, a dream project or something that you'd really like to... Um, you know, work towards over the next decade or something that you see shifting and maybe, um, you know, an area of, um, of potential? It, now I'm feeling it's a quite cheeky question because I, I would find that hard to that's answer a, myself. That's a huge question. Ten years is a long time. Um. <laughs> kind of like, it's like a, I'm just um. thinking about like a jumping forward question and because, yeah. I mean, it feels like we're, we're seeing some shifts, aren't we? Uh, yeah. But I guess... Um, in terms of science and organisation yeah, that I work in, and, yeah. um, I honestly would love to see in sooner than 10 years where um, just working with traditional owners and having an Indigenous lead or co-lead on science projects that involve um, the environment is just second nature. It's, it's nothing amazing, nothing special to talk about because it's just business as usual. And I think that would, yeah, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. yeah. So that um, kind of sense of um, on the ground um, linking where the research is connected to the ground, but it maybe across projects as well that have a national scope that you, you know where to go and how to bring people in. And yeah. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like at the moment in CSIRO when a, a researcher wants to do research in a community and generally they're not an Indigenous scientist. Um, they need advice on who they need to talk to and how they can be involved. And a lot of the time the community is not actually having a question answered that's valuable to them. Um, and so I don't see the point in doing science in those communities if it's not valuable to that community. And so that's kind of what I would want to see the shift in, um, where communities are having questions answered that actually impact their livelihoods, that are beneficial to them, and it's not, yeah, they're not just being used for cheap labour, yeah. <laughs> if I can say that. Yeah. So is that, um, in a sense, th almost like the creation of a, um, a structure where communities are uh, almost like prioritising and dis and um, the conversations about what they want to see yeah. focused on. Uh, Coming down to like that self-governance that, you know, Aboriginal communities in charge of Aboriginal land, which means they are in charge of who is doing research on their land and in their waters and in their seas. Um, yeah. Mm. Sounds good to me, yeah. Phil, what do you think? Uh, um... My dream project is not anything national. It's like my, um, one of my great passions is language revitalization, revitalization of the Ngarrabal language. And um, uh, I was just talking to the mayor of Glen Innes this morning, just coincidentally saw the mayor of Glen Innes at the airport in Melbourne before I flew up there. And she was down in Melbourne for this climate emergency summit. So um, for those who don't know, it was like the bushfires before they were hitting the south coast, like all through northern New South Wales, like the, uh, you know, the town of, Waitalaba, where the mayor of Glen Innes is from, is like almost completely destroyed. And I was sort of having a bit of a catch up about that and uh, talking about how the floods that are happening now are like washing the debris from the fires into the rivers and uh, poisoning the waterways um, across that area. And um, anyway, we got to talking about the, uh, I guess, a pet project of mine, um, which is um, for a bit of, for a bit of context, the dreaming story that I mentioned earlier about Birajangi and Gurai. Um, is a story about climate change. It's a story that 
uh, dates from the end of the last ice age um, when water was rapidly rising, when the McIntyre River didn't actually exist. And the McIntyre River was a series of like, uh, you know, of isolated water holes and the, um, the yeah, rapid changes in the environment that happened as a result of the end of the, the last ice age, uh, what are captured in that story. We have other stories that are like that. So stories that talk about when all the people across northern um, New England spoke the same language and um, yeah, the, um, like essentially stories talk about you know, const flooding and um, changes in the landscape that forced people apart basically, which is what led to the creation of all the different Aboriginal languages that exist across the area now. And um, all those stories are tied to places and they're tied to um, you know, the, the names of places and the language names of places that tell um, yeah, what that environment is and how that environment came to be. And um, I have a, this kind of dream project of having all these little signs and information boots and stuff put up all across our country um, with like the language names of places and the stories about those places and um, what they tell us about the changes that have happened in the environment in the past and what they tell us about what the environment was like before colonisation. You know, so for example, there's a, a um, well we call it a creek now because there's no, not really any water in it, but um, um, the, the name of this like Welling Grove Creek in our language means like a wide flowing stream and as a result of um, you know, a combination of so many droughts and climate change but also animal agriculture um, and the erosion that's occurred as a result of that. It's essentially just a, a muddy swamp now rather than a wide flowing stream but um, my kind of dream is like yeah have that, um, do something like that that tells the story of the of country both before colonisation um, the, the impacts that colonisation has had and the impacts that we're seeing now through climate change in the hope that I guess the process of doing that pulls out a lot of those stories and a lot of those learnings from, that we have from country to um, inform how we adapt to, you know, we're, we're at a point now where it's like dramatic climate change is already locked in. We've already seen that this summer. It's like even if the world, you know, made a sudden decision to cut emissions now, it's like we've reached a point where, you know, we're not going to recover the damage that's already happened. We need to learn to adapt to the changes that have occurred now and those stories will give us the, um, yeah, the knowledge and wisdom that we need to do that. I like the sound of that project. <laughs> yeah, I love the sound of that project. It, it kind of makes me feel like it's a kind of um, energy base, um, the idea of those stories and that sense of richness of place and, and the language and... Um, and I hope something we can all share. And I, when you emailed me back, was it Yaraba? You, you, it was the word Yaraba where you were saying like a gr greetings in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yamagara yeah. Ginda. Yeah, and it's. Um, I I feel like now even even for me like I've been four and a half years here in Brisbane, but colleagues now in Melbourne, I hear more language when they. Um, email me and I think like Australia it's um, it's challenging like I, I find like having Kiwi background and Maori at least there's like one language a couple of dialects but here it's so challenging all the different languages but then it's really beautiful to hear the words and I you know to share with people and I think for us all to aspire to just keep building and growing language but also um, those the care for place um, is really lovely. I know here on the river we've got just these little um, areas of mangroves and there's a little um, uh, beach air area here and, um, you know, our education team had some kids in doing programs thinking about caring for that and some of our colleagues at the museum were actually asking me if I wanted to do a walk every week that they do and pick up papers along the edge of the river and... But I suppose that sense of paying attention and caring, hearing the stories um, is a beautiful, um, you know, powerhouse aspiration to take us to the best future that we can have. Yeah. Phil, Mabu, thank you so much for joining us. And if I could ask our audience to um, uh, give um, our special guests a little clap. Thank you.